Okay, so we'll just proceed, right? So essentially today we had uh, some PMI data uh, and of course tomorrow we'll be having uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Uh, they'll actually be uh, deciding on the monetary policy, whether they're hiking and uh, by how much they'll actually be hiking. Markets currently uh, anticipate a 50 basis point hike or 0.5 percent hike uh, and uh, yeah that is currently what the market is uh, expecting uh, and especially based on the fact that uh, their inflation has been uh, persistently above above target or it is showing signs of being persistent right so if you go into trading economics uh, actually we, we, we won't touch on 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 new zealand let us just focus on the pound for now, right? Let us just focus on the pound because for today, we had a lot of economic data. Uh, we had mostly PMI data, like I said, and PMI data is very important. It's one of those leading indicators, right? So it gives us an indication of what to expect further down the line, especially if a trend develops. This is one thing I always emphasize that only one data point is not sufficient to draw a conclusion from we need to see a trend developing we need to see two or three more readings oh well that that is preferably what i need to see i need to see at least two or three readings in that direction for me to actually understand that a trend has been established right so in that in that regard so in that regard when it comes to the PMI data as well, even though they were mostly, I'd say, positive for some economies, but I still need to see that trend developing, right? So uh, predominantly, I'll just look at the manufacturing side as well as the services. So like we saw, it is declining for the Japanese yen. Didn't actually mean to click on it. It's declining, uh, but we saw an, a surprise to the upside on the services PMI, right? So all of that, I am taking into consideration but like i said i need to see that or indications of a trend fully developing for me to actually take something away from it right so we saw that as well with the euro uh, manufacturing pmi actually came in below expectations but services actually came in way greater than expected which resulted in that spike to the upside in the euro and then of course uh all the all, 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 all the all those gains were faded away eventually uh, and then we also had composite as well which surprised to the upside expectations of 50 came in at around 52 so all those were good even for the pound right 53 expectations were 49 49 expectations were 47 53 expectations were 49 so all those readings are good but like i said one reading is not sufficient for me i still need to see more evidence from the data right as you can see it has been declining and this and it compared to where it has been in the last couple of months this is quite high right so it's in february in january the highest in eight months and beating market expectations of 49.2 so now i need the next reading to also show signs that we now more in an in an echo we entering the expansion phase of the PMIs, because remember anything below 50, we view that as a contraction, especially if it's below 50 and continues to decline further. But now if it's above 50 and then it continues to rise further or may, remain above 50, we view that as a sort of an entering an expansion phase, right? So like I said, one reading is not enough. So that is what we have there with, the, with, with GBP. We also, did I just look at services or manufacturing? Let's let's look at manufacturing now because I think there are services that I just looked at. So if we look at manufacturing, we can see that for manufacturing, there has been a increase in the last two months, right? So there is something that we can take away from there. And then also if we get another third reading that shows an increase, then that would also be what be beneficial, right? In terms of looking at the PMI data or manufacturing data and drawing a conclusion from it. So that is what we have there, which is why I, I, I'm st I, short, I went short on the pound today. Uh, after the news, it actually rallied up and then I actually went short, right? Because 
on the bigger scheme of things, I'm still short, I'm still bearish on the pound, uh, but this is just one data point. And then if we get more subsequent data that supports the very same narrative of a rebound in the, in, in, in the health of the economy down the line, then you could look to maybe reposition uh, when it comes to the pound. But most importantly, we always, always keep an, an eye and we need to have an understanding of what the central bank wants, what they want to achieve, what they're looking at, and where, and where they're actually trying to, 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 to take the, the economy, right? So or where, in which direction they're actually trying to steer the economy. So that is most important. And then we also had Canadian inflation rate of which it showed a, 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 a slowdown as well, as with most economies. And then we had PMI data for the US, manufacturing actually came in slightly better than expected. Uh, composite actually better than expected as well, as well as the services, right? So that was also good. We can also look into that. Uh, and like I said, we need to see a trend developing. So similar picture here to the pound, two, two readings showing growth, but we need to see that trend being established for us to actually have something to take away from it, right? And then if we look at the manufacturing side of things, uh, let us see the manufacturing. And remember with the, with the, with the dollar, uh, we also have the University of Michigan, right? Uh, not the University of Michigan, sorry, the, um, the ISM. The ISM uh, non-manufacturing PMI as well as the ISM manufacturing PMI, those, those, those are, are the indicators that are, that are paid most attention to for the US, right? In terms of the, of the PMI data. Of course, the S&P Global as well, but that is what the market reacts to the most. So as you can see here, it's been two, two months of higher reading, still below 50 but it's showing an increase. So like I said, we really need more data to actually draw a conclusion from this. And which is one of the reasons why I, I, I still went short on the pound, but for the dollar, even though it's also not enough sufficient to draw conclusion, but based on all the other data that we received in the past couple of days, uh, or we, last week predominantly, as I, as I explained in the, in the last, uh, lesson that we had and and i went over why it, it it the narrative just became stronger for me to actually buy the dollar based on the data that we had right so with the pound i still i still maintain my bearish bias and I, that is essentially one of the reasons why i went short the pound even though we had the spike to the upside after after the actual uh yeah this was I think it was around 11, yeah. After the actual PMI data, we show we saw we saw a rally to the upside. And then of course I faded that and went short, right? Because I still maintain the same, the same bias. And this is only just data that is not sufficient enough for me to actually draw a conclusion and say, okay, the tide is changing and now we are bullish on the pound, right? So that is pretty much what we had for today. And then, like I said, for tomorrow, we'll have the New Zealand. Uh, interest rate decision of which I won't go into that for for this particular lesson, right? And then if we look at the pound, let us just look at the Bank of England. Let us just look at the Bank of England to see what they say, right, from their monetary policy. <clears throat> so we can actually get to understand where they stand. So their, their meeting was, yeah, it was in February.
Okay, yeah, so. Okay, so published on the 2nd of February, of course, they increased uh, to 4%. So monetary policy summary, the Bank of England uh, MPC sets monetary policy to meet the 2% inflation target and in a way that helps to sustain growth and employment. At its meeting ending on the 1st of February, 2023, the Monetary Policy Committee voted by a majority of seven to two to increase bank rate by 0.5 percent points to 4%. Two members preferred to maintain bank rate at 3.5%. Global consumer price inflation remains high, although it is likely to have peaked across many advanced economies, including in the UK. Wholesale gas prices have fallen recently and global supply chain disruptions appears to have eased amid a slowing in global demand. So many central banks have continued to tighten monetary policy, although market pricing indicates reductions in policy rates further ahead. UK domestic inflationary pressures have been firmer than expected. Both private sector regular pay growth and services CPI inflation have been notably higher than forecast in the November monetary policy report. The labor market remains tight by historical standards, although it has started to loosen and some survey indicators of wage growth have eased alongside a gradual decline in underlying output. Given the lags in monetary policy transmission, the increase in the bank rate since December 2021 are expected to have an increasing impact on the economy in the coming quarters. Near-term data developments will be crucial in assessing how quickly and to what extent and to what extent external and domestic inflationary pressures will abate. As set out in the accompanying February monetary policy report, the MPC's updated projections show CPI inflation falling back sharply from its current very elevated level of 10.5% in December, in large part owing to past increases in energy and other goods prices falling out of the calculation of the annual rate. Annual CPI inflation is expected to fall to around 4% towards the end of this year, alongside a much shallower projected decline in output than in the November report forecast. In the latest model forecast, conditioned on, conditioned on a market implied path for bank rate that rises to around 4.5% in mid 2023 and falls back to just over three and, and a quarter uh, in three years' time. An increasing degree of economic slack alongside falling external pressures leads CPI inflation to decline to below the 2% target in the medium term. There are considerable uncertainties around this medium-term outlook, and the committee continues to judge that the risks to inflation are skewed significantly to the upside. The MPC's remit uh, is clear that the inflation target applies at all times, reflecting the primary price stability in the UK monetary policy framework. The framework recognizes that there will be occasions when inflation will depart from the target, as a result of shocks and disturbances, the economy has been subject to a sequence of very large and overlapping shocks. Monetary policy will ensure that as the adjustment to these shocks continues, CPI inflation will return to 2% targets sustainably in the medium term. Monetary policy is also acting to ensure that longer term inflation expectations are anchored at 2% targets. The committee has voted to increase bank rate by 0.5% points to 4% at this meeting. Headline CPI inflation has begun to edge, to edge back and is likely to fall sharply over the rest of the year as a result of past movements in energy and other goods prices. However, the labor market remains tight and domestic price and wage pressures have been stronger than expected, suggesting risks of greater persistence in underlying inflation. The extent to which domestic inflationary pressures ease will depend on the evolution, including the impact of significant increases in bank rates so far. There are considerable uncertainties around the outlook. The Monetary Policy Committee will continue to monitor closely indications of persistent inflationary pressures, including the tightness of labor market conditions and the behavior of wage growth and services inflation. If there were to be evidence of more persistent pressures, then further tightening in monetary policy would be required. Looking further ahead, the Monetary Policy Committee will adjust bank rate as necessary to return inflation to 2% targets sustainably in the medium term in line with its remit. So you can continue to 
this is more this elaborates more in terms of it focuses on monetary and financial conditions gdp in terms of growth uh and then so yeah but essentially the story there with the uk they're still looking to raise rates uh they they expect of course for inflation to decline back to around four uh to around four percent uh, towards the end of this year, that is the expectations in terms of uh, headline inflation, uh, and then in terms of the interest rate increases to rise to around four and a half percent. Currently sitting at four percent, so maybe another zero point five percent to go, and then eventually falling back to uh, over three, just above three and a quarter in three years' time. Right, so that is that is essentially the path. That, that the central bank is looking at, right? So that is that is in a nutshell what we're getting there. And then if we go on to the actual data now and we look at forecasts to actually get a picture of what is the data actually telling us? Because they even say that if, if there are inflationary pressures that seem to be persistent, then they will continue to hike. So what is the data telling us, right? So let us just look at the currency. Uh, the British pound cl crossed the 1.21, recovering from a six-week six low of 119 hit on February 17th as invested monitors stronger than expected PMI data and softer than feared inflation. Flash figures showed output for private sector business rebounded after six months of contraction with both the manufacturing and services sectors achieving a return to growth, encouraging resilience of the economy. At the same time, Headline inflation slowed more than expected in January to 10.1%, moving further away from October's 41-year high of 11.1%, but remaining well above the central bank's target of 2% on the monetary policy front. UK policymakers raised interest rates to 4%, a 10th consecutive hike, and expected to raise them just twice more to peak at 4.5% by June, with the risk that they stop earlier at 4.25%, right? So that's, that is what we're getting there. And then if we look at the, let us look at uh, GDP. So uh, GDP growth, so quarterly GDP, you can see that it has been, so it, the British economy stalled in the last quarter of 2022. So we saw it has been decreasing, right? Essentially decreasing and then dipped into a negative and then eventually came in at zero. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not looking good in terms of growth wise, looking at GDP. Uh, so you can read the whole story here of which it, they give their, their two cents as well and, and a clearer explanations of why. So we could, yeah, let, let me just read it actually. So the British economy stalled in the last quarter of 2022 following a downwardly revised 0.2% fall in the previous period and narrowly, narrowly uh, escaping a recession. Figures came in line with market expectations. Preliminary estimates showed the services sector slowed to flat output driven by falls in education and transport and storage subsectors. Also growth of 0.3% in construction was offset by 0.2 fall in the production sector. On the expenditure side, growth in household, government expenditure and cost fixed capital formation was offset by a fall in international trade flows. Exports declined 1% while imports were up 1.5%. Figures also showed businesses were destocking their levels of inventories in the final quarter of the year. The level of quarterly GDP is now 0.8% below its pre-coronavirus level. Considering full, full 2022, the British economy expanded 4% following a 7.6% increase in 2021. So let us look at a three-year... Okay, let's look at a tenure. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's pretty much around pre-COVID, yeah, around pre-COVID levels. That is what we have there with GDP. So we saw that it has been declining. Uh, and then if we look at if we look at the labor market, let us look at unemployment rate, or let us look at first unemployed persons. Okay, we can see that unemployed persons, it has been decreasing, which is which is good. And then if you look at uh, employed persons, we 
you can see that, okay, that has also been increasing. So that is good. Unemployment rate, which is also at uh, historical low levels, which is not bad, uh, which we saw that it started to loosen at around July. So after July, so it's say August, increasing from 3.5 to 3.6, and then now currently holding at 3.7. So uh, that it, that is also something to pay attention to, right? So maybe if the next reading shows an increase to the upside, maybe let's say 3.8, or maybe just it remains at 3.7, uh, but it's something to pay attention to, right? To see if whether is a trend developing when it comes to the unemployment. And then if you look at uh, inflation, let us look at core consumer, CPI, core inflation. As you can see, core inflation has been decreasing, which it's good. And then if you look at the inflation rate as well, you can see that it has also been edging, edging lower. And then if you look at the PPI, uh, not the PPI, sorry, inflation rate on the monthly, We can see that it dipped it dipped into into a negative territory right on in the monthly in the monthly change right so what we'd say that yeah inflation is is falling um and if that's the case then it might not really require the bank of england to actually hike as aggressively and also at the same time if we have growth which is also uh showing that it is stagnating when it comes to growth as we've seen with gdp uh then there might not really be much of a necessity for the bank of england to continue hiking right or maybe to they might even pause at 4.25 percent as we previously read uh when we're just analyzing the actual currency right rather than actually getting to four and a half percent by by media or by mid 2023 so that is what we have there and then if you look at uh, interest rates, of course, they've been going up. Interest rates have been going up. We also looked at uh, we also looked at the PMI side of things. We looked at PMI, so we can look at uh, the consumer now. So let us look at consumer confidence. Okay, consumer, okay, it's still, it's still, it dipped even further into the negative. So consumer confidence is not the best. And then if we look at disposable personal income, we can see that that has also dropped significantly, right? Uh, yeah, that, that dropped significantly as well, right? So maybe the high interest rates are, uh, are causing the, the the consumers to actually feel a squeeze on the on the, on their disposable income. Let us actually see consumer spending. If we see if, if that is also declining, that has actually surprisingly been on the on the on an increase. And though even though it has actually flattened, but it has been on an increase, right? So based on based on the on the on on the pound. Just looking at the economy side after reading the monetary policy or the summary of the monetary policy. I'd say it can go either way, right? But we need more data to actually support growth or to support that there is resilience in the economy and uh, that it can support further hikes, right? If because if inflation is starting to slow, we saw like we saw with the with the monthly inflation figures actually dipping into the dipping into the negative on a monthly change basis. Um, and we're seeing that continue. Because remember, like I said, one reading is not substantial for us to draw a conclusion. We need to see a trend developing. So if we see that maybe in the next two readings, uh, then we might draw a conclusion from that. But essentially, I'm not really bullish on the pound. I, I still remain uh, bearish, especially with the whole external factors that could, could actually affect the pound. Like we still have the war between Russia and Ukraine going on. So if that were to escalate, that would to a certain degree have an effect on, on energy prices. Uh, and if and then of course the UK will feel will feel the effects of that as well, right? So we do have all those uh, external factors, those geopolitical factors that pose a, a serious risk for the pound, uh, for the euro actually, essentially eurozone even and the UK. So that is why I'm not as as 
confidently uh, bullish, like I'd say maybe with the dollar. Uh, when it comes to the to the euro, the euro as well, I'm not I'm not necessarily ultra dovish or either ultra bullish. I'd say I'm pretty much flat when it comes to the euro. I think I'd prefer it to look at other currencies, at trading other currencies than the euro because I still feel that there's some steam in the dollar. So there's more strength in the dollar. So I wouldn't really look to be buying the euro at that point. Uh, so I'd look at trading other economies. And uh, <clears throat> of course, that is why I'd look at shorting the pound uh, in this in this sense, right? So, but pretty much that is what I had there. So just as a recap for today that we had those PMI figures. And then in addition to having those PMI figures, uh, I also went short on the pound based on based on what I've just explained uh, most recently or shortly, right? So any of any of you guys actually have any questions? Any questions uh, for today's session, or maybe any any questions that you might have had from the previous um, session? I just had a uh, quick question. Yeah. So regarding the trade you took um, based on PMI data, was it based on central bank statement, or was it just because of the data also? Uh, the the GBP trade. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily based on 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 like I said. There wasn't much that I could draw from the PMI. It's mm -hmm. just one data data point that surprised mm -hmm. to the upside, which of course mm -hmm. would be positive for the pound. Mm -hmm. But overall, it, for me, it hasn't changed the outlook for the pound. Okay. So that is why I went, I went short. It came to a level where I think it would be ideal to actually short. So okay. I just waited for confirmation and I went short, yeah. Okay, but so your overall... Um, your overall... Um bias was based on the central bank yeah yeah it was based okay. on the central bank and the data like i just went over with gdp yeah. what has been happening and all of that yeah yeah okay so that's all i just want a little bit of clarification on that okay uh, Dobby, I got any questions mm, no questions okay. uh, actually can i just ask you um so why, just, this is a technical question, but um, why did you take your short from that level? <laughs> I don't know if you want to cover that in this session or not, but. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's simple. It's what everybody trades, supply and demand. Okay. So, yeah, just on the daily time frame, it's, it's, it's it's a it's a supply level so i just waited for price to get back to this level okay. give me confirmation that we might have some selling pressure there yeah and then i executed yeah but that's a pretty big sl you have there though <laughs> uh my stop loss uh it's, my stop loss is pretty pretty small stop loss is like what 25 oh. pips how did you manage such a tight squeeze <laughs> i i i dive into the lower time frames Oh, okay, okay. Because where yeah. I went short on uh where I went short on GU was much higher. Um, yeah. it was over on just give me a second. One, two, four, three, two, seven. That's where I went short. But I mean still my, my stop loss is pretty high. Um yeah. Oh. I usually have I usually have like 25 to 30 pips stop. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 how big my stop loss usually, especially on the on the major currencies. Maybe then on some exotic pairs it might be bigger, but that's usually around yeah, because I use I drill down to the lower time frame, which probably you also do the same. But I drill down to the lower time frames to actually get that confirmation, and then enter based off that. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, okay, so I 
guess if there if there aren't any more questions, um, that'll be it for tonight's session. Uh, and then, okay, I'll keep everyone uh, posted on when we'll have the next session. Uh, yeah, I'll keep everyone posted because I don't want to commit and say tomorrow and then something comes up tomorrow, but I'll keep everyone posted with regards to that. Sure, okay. Um, just, just out of curiosity, again, regarding the technical entry you had, was your... Um, SL or was your supply zone on the four hour time frame or the three hour time frame? Daily. Yeah, I'm saying you said you refined it to the smaller time frame, right? Yeah. So you, did you refine to the four hour or the three hour? Because I'm just checking something on my chart here. That's what I'm asking. No, no, no. I use the actual daily supply, but entry confirmation, I I, I looked at the lower time frames. So I don't refine my, my supply level that, okay, it's a daily supply. Then I'll look for a four hour supply to refine it further. It's like how they do with all those uh, order blocks and everything. No, if it's a daily supply, just take the daily and I'd look at price action once, once the market actually retests that supply level and I wait for confirmation on the lower time frames. Okay. Yeah, so essentially, I'm not looking to refine the actual supply. I'm just waiting for an entry on the lower time frames. That's it. Okay, no worries. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, I'm still a little confused, boy. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I also like I also use supply and demand. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you can give me screen sharing um, privileges so I can show you why why I'm a little confused here. Okay. Uh, let me actually do that. So obviously, that's just supply on the daily, right? Yeah. And then if we refine that. The way I learned supply and demand is if that's your if that's your supply zone, your yeah. SL would be up here above the zone, right? That's where your SL should be. Mm -hmm. And then if you were to refine it to the lower time frame at the H4, um, you could pretty much say this would be up there. Let's, let's, let's see something. It's a little laggy. That doji candle there. Yeah. Because that's the last, you know, before we had our departure yeah, candles. Before we had, yeah. And then if, uh, do you have an H3? No, 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 I don't. I don't. Okay, let me just try and refine this. You could actually use this zone right that down, one here. down there on the one now, yeah. Yeah. Why is it not letting me go? Oh. <laughs> okay. And that essentially would be like your zone for entry, right? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was just refining. That's what I was um just referring to. I saw I was a little confused why you have such a small stop loss. So like oh. that would be that would be an appropriate entry and stop loss, right? Okay, for me, yeah. Based on based on how how you've explained it, how you how you understand your stop placement and everything. So yeah. for me, okay, let me just I'll take back control to just show you. Okay. So for me, essentially, how I do it, it's okay. First and foremost how I view supply and demand is I need evidence, right? To show that it is a, I don't want to say strong supply or strong demand level, but I need mm -hmm. to show some, it needs to show some evidence that there was some pressure there. If it's a supply, I need to see some selling pressure. If it's a demand, I need to see some buying pressure. 
how do I see that without maybe plotting any indicators or if there are any that actually show that? Essentially, it's the candles, right? Because if the, this daily candle, this bearish yeah. daily candle is able to close below this, the, the last, the previous bullish daily candle, then that means that there was momentum, right? Because if we're able to close below the, the previous candles low, that shows that there is momentum to the downside. So for me, if I were to refine, I don't usually do that, but if I were to refine this daily, I would need to see a similar setting on the lower time frames. So essentially, I'd need to see a bearish engulfing within this daily time frame for me to consider that a zone that I would refine to. So what I what do I mean? Like this that you that you correctly uh based on how you look at demand or, or, or supply levels, you correctly highlighted this as a what as the actual zone, right? But for me, I wouldn't because there isn't evidence from here initially, even though, yes, we had a fall in price, but from here initially, there isn't evidence that there was selling pressure. Because after this bullish candle, I'd need to see a strong bearish candle to the downside for me to say, okay, this for our, this for our supply, then I can use. Mm -hmm. That is how I view it. Okay. So for me, which is why when you asked if did I refine, I'm like, no, I just use the daily because it's I only got that from the daily time frame. Because even if I go to the one hour, like I said, I don't use all those the other time frames. Yeah. But if I go into the one hour time frame, if I were to refine within this daily, this would be the only level I'd look at. This one right here. Mm -hmm. Because it had that what that bearish engulfing which shows that there was momentum to the downside there was some selling pressure there mm -hmm. but then in this case i did not refine it i just stuck to the daily right mm -hmm. so and then from there i go into the lower time frames i could go into your one minute i can go into your five minutes and then i just look for an entry just wait for confirmation right once price gets there i need to see some the same thing some bearish pressure and then i execute based on that Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So for me, that is how I essentially I, I select my supply and demand zones. I need to oh, see okay. evidence that okay. there and was some from from that that bullish candle. If it's a supply, immediately after that bullish candle, there needs to be some bearish pressure that follows through. If it's a okay. demand after that bearish can that last bearish candle, there needs to be some bullish pressure that follows through. But that's just how I view it. Okay, and if you are, since you're zoning down to the one minute or five minute, would yeah. you, how do you avoid volatility and getting waked out by volatility? Uh, I can't say I, I, I have a way of avoiding it. I just wait for confirmation. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay. Yeah, I just wait for confirmation. So essentially... Um, so essentially I just wait for confirmation once price gets here it needs to form the high what I'd, and here's another thing what I'd consider the high of the day at that point in time because as I'm trading I'm also looking at the daily candle or the daily open where am I if I'm looking to sell I need to be above the daily open you know I'm, I'm looking I'm, I'm keeping it in mind all those things because I'm uh, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of the formation of the daily candle that, okay, if this is an actual supply level, that is going to push prices lower. I need to enter as close as possible to the high of the day. So I okay. also keep that in mind, right? Okay. So with that happening, this was the high here previously, but then we had another push higher and then we, we saw the sell-off. So on a, this, on a retest of that, that is where I'd enter. Mm -hmm. And then after entry, like I say, 25 to 30 pips stop loss. Then I'd have, let's, let's just use 30 pips. And then if I'm, if price pushes up and takes me out, it takes me out. Okay. So yeah, um, let me just ask you. Uh, so is that inverted hammer, right? There was the high of the day when you were looking at price action, right? Exactly. Uh, so why didn't you enter on that massive bearish candle we had? Um, just three candles over to the right. Which one? This one here. Yeah. 
because that's that wasn't the high of the day. This one was the high of the day. Oh, okay, okay, now I get what you're saying. Now this so, one, the following one was below this one. Okay, so the, the, your confirmation the, essentially is high of the day, bearish yeah. or bullish engulfing candle, and then we exactly. get momentum from there. Okay, exactly. Because for me, that that is the only way I know personally. Mm -hmm. I'm sure maybe if you know any other way, you can definitely share that. But that is for me the only way visually I can see that. Okay, there is some sort of momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that makes so much more sense now. Yeah, because it because in the back of my mind, I'm picturing this daily candle, and I'm thinking, yeah. okay, if I'm looking to sell, I definitely want to sell. Okay, where's the open? Uh, let me just use a horizontal line. So the open was here. Of this daily candle. Oh, let me use this magnet too. So the open was around here. So in as all this, or as I'm above here and approaching this daily supply, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely above the, the, the open. So I'm in a good position that if I were to, if this trade were to work out, I would have probably entered around the wick. Okay. Or the high of the day. So that is what I'm thinking of. As I as I as I'm drilling down to the lower time frames. And like I said, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But that is just how it how it usually works for me. And okay. that is how I have those tight stop losses. Yeah, no, that makes a lot more sense now. Because the way yeah. I learned, I learned supply and demand is like your entry, you put your pending order at the bottom of the candle or whatever, and then your stop loss is like the whole zone, right? But I didn't yeah. know you refined it to such a smaller time frame. That, that makes a lot more sense, yeah. Yeah, I do. But like I said, I also I, I need to have, I don't just go into the one minute. I need mm -hmm. for what what I consider to be a, 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 a supply level or a demand level that shows yeah. some momentum from it. Number one, number two, <clears throat> sorry. I need to go into the lower time frame and I need to see the same thing. That once okay. price gets there, it's showing me that confirmation as well. Then I enter, it needs to be either the high or the low of the day. Okay. Uh, and then sometimes preferably the high or the low of the week. Okay. So that's that's just how I frame it. Okay, sure thing. And then yeah. um, let me ask you about that candle on the the hammer on the left, the far left. Um, uh, for our. All the way to the left. Which one? Right, just right up there on the left area. Yeah. 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 Um, how would you use that for an entry? Because that could um count as a supply level correct yep okay uh price did come retested it and rebound a little bit and then when the third time it came it broke it and reversed and broke the previous low um so how would uh, you at this point yeah yeah so how would you um that is when that i price entered price action oh, okay can you yeah. please explain that one because <laughs> it looks like it broke um <laughs> Essentially, it was this, it was this one was driven by news. Okay. This one was when we had the news. So I also look when we when we when we get to our zone, is are there any news releases? I think it was uh inflation. Yeah, it was inflation, the US inflation okay. last week. Okay. Yeah, and then based on what I, what I got from inflation, especially shelter, uh actually high being higher or showing more persistence. Uh, then I decided that, okay, based on that actual data, I'm going to short what I'm going to short the, I even, I even, yeah, I even said it on, on Instagram that I'm looking to short or to buy the dollar or how not necessarily I'm looking to buy, but based on price action, it seems as if we're setting up for a dollar buy yeah, as a reaction to the CPI. Okay. And okay, I'll get, I'll get into that in, for, in future videos in terms of how do I, before some news releases how do i actually look at the market analyze the market to see which likely direction and then if data comes out and actually supports that direction then i i had already established my zone where i'm looking to to go short or go long because that is what happened here as well so when mm -hmm. price got here i understood that we had what we had news release so i had to wait for that volatility to come in and then drill down to the lower time frames and then execute. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that's all. That's all I want a little bit of confirmation on. That's all. Yeah, because my first entry 
was around is around this this area just yeah, yeah. i think just around here But, but essentially that is how that is just how I view it in terms of supply and demand. And then of course I wait for confirmations. But whenever there's news release, I don't really wait that much for my confirmation. I know that there will be volatility, so we will get that spike mm -hmm. or what maybe some people might call a stop hunt or something. So yeah. I just wait for that to happen. And then of course I'm looking at the data. I'm also looking at from a technical perspective, there's certain things that I need to see going into the news release and then okay. if all those things actually align then i'm confident enough to take my trade and then if i it's an l it's an l that no 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 big no big big issue yeah. about it yeah okay i know that makes a lot more sense now makes so much more sense because knowing out and knowing what i know now if i had taken this church is based on my supply and demand that would have been wicked out and price oh, yeah. reverse and gone in the direction I wanted it to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's all it's all about that confirmation. And that is why I just drill into the lower time frames. And then same thing applies. Are we be above the high of the day? Are we are we slightly up uh, not not above, but are we close as possible to the high of the day? Or are we at the high of the day when I get that confirmation to enter? Are we as close as possible to the high of the week? So I look at all those things. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Any more questions? Uh, no questions this side because it, it's technically yes, saying I grasp. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. If that's the case. Uh, We'll, we'll call it a wrap. And like I said, uh, I'll keep everyone posted uh, on when we'll have the next session. So thank you guys for tuning in, uh, for your time and your attention. And uh, see everyone on the next one. Sure. So yes. Yeah.